by how much um, you share the gospel. So you can judge your faith by how much you share the faith. And if you think about it, if you think about it, I'm going to show you in the in the uh, receiving communion that this is how Jesus was. If you think about it, if you had in you, like somehow you're a mad scientist or whatever, and you developed the cure for the pandemic or AIDS or whatever people are dying of, and you have taken it and you know it works. It totally, 100% works. You were at the door of death, at death's door, and you took something, boom. You're cured, you're healed, it's over, you're healthy. Did you just take it and hide it and not tell anybody? People laid out, dying, your mama's sick, your kids are sick, your, your, everybody around you is sick, and on the way to death, and you have the cure, and you just like, yeah, I pray you're strengthened for it. You would, you wouldn't do that. You would be doing everything you could to deliver that cure to every needy soul, right? Amen. I would be. So guess what? Guess what salvation does for the heart? It heals it. Someone told me yesterday. I was. Someone told me. Ah. Ah. You know. You, you know. I, I want to come, but you know they. Their mindset, they said, I don't want to mess up your followers. <laughs> and then they said, I'm going to follow you too, but you know, I, I, I curse like a trucker. You know, I come in there, I'm, ah. you, you know, they were telling me that, and I, in my heart, I'm working with this person, I'm just like, if you only knew what salvation does in the heart. For me, that was something. My filthy, dirty mouth. When I got saved, it was done. By God's grace, I've not said a curse word since September 11th, uh, not last year, uh, 1982. <laughs> okay, it's like they, they, they don't come out. They may be in my mind, and they would say, go ahead, just say it. And I'll say, praise the Lord! <laughs> okay, that's just something that happened to me. But what I'm saying is, salvation fixes it. And everybody is, is touched by sin. Whether they're ravaged with um, uh, drug addiction or alcoholism or they're, they're caught up in something else that's destroying their life. Maybe, maybe it's a guy who's uh, a womanizer and has kids all over the place and you know, his poor, poor children don't have a daddy and you know, vice versa, sometimes mama's that way. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, I guess I gotta speak in here so it records properly, I'm sorry. She's working on me. What I'm saying is, the answer for the world, the answer for every sin is Jesus Christ. In the, and we'll, we'll read this in Luke chapter 22. We'll read this. The scriptures will receive communion. But right after that, right after that, there was some teaching. Two of the disciples um, wanted to, I guess all of them were striving who was going to be the greatest among them. And Jesus took time to teach. And then it got down to verse, this is in in verses 23, 24, and Jesus taught. And then down in verse 31, Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Simon had been following Jesus now for approximately three years. Some say three and a half, but whatever. It's right in there. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's Peter, Simon, Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan wanted to grab a hold of Peter and just let him, parts of him fall right through his hands. 
Look what Jesus said. But I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. When Naomi was born, uh, Abby got really sick. We came home for two days and took her to the hospital and they shipped her to uh, COVID. You know, she was a COVID patient in the hospital for a week. And so Abby's mom and I were taking care of Naomi. What was the hardest thing about being in a hospital? Not seeing Naomi. <laughs> Not having her baby. She said, could you at least just take a video of her crying and send it to me? I didn't connect. I was just dealing with stuff, you know, dealing with, the, you know, uh, dealing with the little girl and, you know, it was just whatever, praying for my wife. And I didn't realize she had given birth. Now she's about dying. You know what was on her mind? The one she gave birth to. When we talk to other people and they, 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 they give their heart to Jesus or they start to pray, it's like giving birth. It's like, it's like a new, uh, especially when they really get saved, a new person is born. Guess what? If they're 80 years old or they're 60 years old, they're a newborn babe in Christ and they need to follow up. Here is Simon Peter, the oldest, you know, we believe he's the oldest of the disciples. He's a, a, a possibly in his 30s, okay? And uh, he's been following Jesus for all this time. They just had communion, you know, he's, Jesus getting ready to go to the cross. And what is Jesus doing? He's following up. He's following up. Do you want to live in a victorious, victorious life for Christ? I'll tell you how. Give birth. Give birth to, a, to someone else, to a convert. And then be a mother or a father. And guess what? Whatever I'm going through, uh, it can wait. I gotta make sure this new person is taken care of. Do they have a ride to church? Their car break down. New people, new people, a lot of times that, that are just starting to really give themselves to God, sometimes they forget what day it is. Like, hey, hey, Sister Beth, uh, uh, I, did, I didn't see you in church. What day is it? Well, it's, it's Saturday afternoon, I'm just, or Sunday afternoon. I'm, I forgot, I thought it was Saturday. I've had 40 year old people tell me that. Amen? Amen. So here is Jesus, all of this. This has just been on my heart. And I, um, part of it is I got this little pamphlet that I, I gave out to some of you. I want to give out to everyone. I forgot them at the house. So <laughs> we all need help, right? <laughs> it's called Born to Reproduce. And I gave it, I think Sue and, and Joyce each have one. It is challenging. It will challenge you to the very core, okay, uh, about being a witness for Christ. So let's read the scriptures. Let's take communion. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here. We love you. We pray for you. You're on, you're on our heart. We pray for you. I appreciate Don and Sybil. Uh, I pray for them. And, uh, uh, God, Don testifies about God working in his life, and I, it, it encourages me. He, he says I encourage him, but he encourages me too, so uh, he's a blessing. So we're glad to be here. It's exciting. Um, verse number, let's go back now. We'll read the scriptures and we'll, we'll pray and receive communion together. Verse 
number 15, Jesus said, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and he gave thanks and brake it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood which is shed for you. So the body, the bread represents the body that was given. There are scriptures that tie that to healing. Guess what? I believe in divine healing. God has been so, so merciful and good to me, okay? I believe, do I get sick? Yeah, at times, but I just, I start praying and asking God for help. Am I afraid to go to the hospital? No, I just prefer not. So uh, it's kind of a last, last resort. Uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against doctors, I'm not against medicine, but uh, I want to go to my father first. Maybe he wants to humble me by letting me lay in the hospital for a couple of days. I can deal with that. That's what he wants. But I always want to go and believe him for, for healing first. So he gives the bread for our body, healing of the body, the, the wine or the grape juice, for the, uh, uh, that's a whole teaching, okay, I believe it's not fermented wine to represent the life-giving blood of Jesus, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. He gave the cup of the, the uh, grape juice for the, uh, represent the shedding of his blood, which washes away our sins. One more, one more little, little saying, little, little uh, kind of something I wanted to say for that. We, we are praying, we are praying. There's one guy that, that uh, plays the bass real good. I'm trying to get him to really be saved. Love to have more instruments up here, uh, more singing voices, okay? Um, and you, you be in prayer, okay? You bring prayer. God's, God's looking for people to, to lead worship, be part of worship, lead service. Um, all of us should be able to go to a friend's house and open the Bible and say, let's read this. Amen. And uh, God is just looking for us to do our part. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your love, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we can receive communion. Thank you, Lord, for this fellowship day. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the body that you, you gave your body for us, for our healing. You gave your blood for us, for the salvation of our soul. Oh, dear God, oh, dear God, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, you came. You've been rejected by so many. God, I rejected you for years of my life, but Jesus, Lord, I'm so glad you didn't give up on me and you had people witness to me and share the gospel with me. When I began to read the Bible, you opened my mind and my heart to help me. I love you. God, bless this day. Bless the man as he ministers the word of God in just a little while. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
do we not need the Holy Spirit to mm-hmm. operate just in life in general? Yes. So we, we want everything the Holy Spirit has to, to give us. So um, this morning I'm going to share a message, and um, I kind of apologize, but I don't. It's, it is New Living Translation that I'm using this morning, which probably none of you have. Does anybody have that? We're going to connect this morning. Awesome. So if you do have the phone, I would just go to your New Living Translation on your phone if you want to follow along. Because it obviously when you do have different translation, it is definitely like, what is he saying? So you might want to do that. But we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 this morning. Um, so it makes it easy to follow along um, with that. Um, actually, the couple things that were said this morning already go right along with the message. Um, first of all, the song, The Cross, um, is what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, <coughs> Arlen also shared that, just about sharing the message. Um, but I like to, um, um, when, you, when you read your Bible and just study, however you do it, how everybody's different, but I really like to go back and say, okay, when Paul wrote first and second Corinthians, it was one of his 13 letters, um, where was it at from Jerusalem? Because Paul was in Jerusalem when he was a Pharisee. He was one of the probably, I think the reason God had him write so many letters is because he was a smart dude. And theologically, he was like one of the leaders of the religious sect, the Pharisees. So more than anybody out of the disciples, he probably um, knew the Old Testament more than any of them as far as the, the leadership position he was in. Um, but then I also look at, um, Paul wrote it, who was he writing it to? Corinth, actually, if you look on a map someday, it's really straight up the Mediterranean Sea, about 2,000 miles on a ship. So it's not a, it's not a dry to Spokane, it's, it's a long speaking way. If you travel around on land, I think it's like 3,500 miles, um, back then when they had their Corvettes, um, and all the, the, the Autobahns back then, right? Um, so it wasn't, uh, Paul went there on ship. They went to many places on ship in the Mediterranean. The other thing about Corinth, it was a, it was a city on the, by the sea, so there was a lot of uh, economic stuff happening there, a lot of trade. Um, but we also got to think this, and, and I'm going to tie this into where you guys live. Um, it was very obvious. Um, Paul didn't originally bring the message there. The message was already there. Paul went, I think he spent 18 months at Corinth. So he did teach them, but it was already a church that had begun. And um, so he went there. But if we think about it, um, what the message that they were bringing was, and I'll read here in a minute, uh, was completely the exact same thing that you guys are trying to do in a community that has two cultures, or has a culture, um, and it wouldn't be any different if you went to Corinth or if you went to Scotland and tried to preach a message of the same message of the cross, or anywhere else in the world, South America, Africa, so it's not just this where you live, but this is where you live, so we're going to talk about that. So Paul's message to them was like, how do we connect with these people? They were very influenced by Greece, so... They had philosophers, they had debaters, they had all these people who loved to argue. I mean, they would have like 10 halls just go there and we're just gonna argue about stuff. Are, are butterflies real? I mean, they, anything, they're just gonna argue. That's who they were. They were debaters and, and philosophers. So they were very influenced by Greek culture. And in Greek culture, if you were smart, you were like very well liked. You were, people would come and listen to you because you could debate really new stuff and you really didn't know anything but you thought you knew stuff and you sounded like you knew stuff so uh, uh, compared to God you didn't really know anything so Paul is bringing this message um, but like the first song we sang and what Aaron said this morning about sharing the message of the gospel Paul said this and we'll read it in a second I'm going to bring you one thing the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and this is the, what I want to, I'm going to share next week at our church. I've been doing a, a series on the kingdom of God, which I think Arlen's been doing, right? And um, 
I've been showing for a few months now on that, and the message I'm going to bring next week and the message I have for today is that if we would continue to step back from what we think we should do and what we think we have to do and how we think we have to do it and rely more on the foolish, absolute foolish message of the cross of Jesus Christ, a lot more would get done. And I'm not talking just here. Now there's a reason behind that, is because when you bring the message of how God saved you and the message of the cross, and really it's how Jesus makes you right to the Father, right? How he saves you, how he makes you righteous, because we can't do that on our own, a lot more would get done. And the reason why is because if I go to Abby and don't know who she is and just have this relationship through work or whatever it is and I start sharing this message of the cross and if I just focus on what Jesus did to save us, to, to, to forgive us of our sins, you know who's working behind the scenes when she goes home after the day's over, when she's sitting there making dinner for her family at night, when she goes to bed at night, when she gets up in the morning, she can't get this thing out of her mind but there's a cross, and it makes no sense at all. But who's in her mind? Who's in her heart? It's the Holy Spirit. See, if we do what the Bible says when it comes to the message of the cross, there's so much that happens behind the scenes in their heart. But we're guilty. Not all the time. I'm, and again, I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just saying that. I've done this a million times. There's a story in college when I got saved, you know, I think it was 1987, so in 1989, I, I knew a little bit more because I studied a lot. I didn't study anything in college, I didn't study the Bible after that. Uh, I don't know how I passed, but I did. And, and I was pretty radical about studying why the Bible's true and why it's God's word and, you know, reading all those things, the facts. And, and I, this one lady who it was a friend of Lori and I's at the time, and um, they're farmers, they're big farmers south of Spokane, Liberty area, and um, she brought her boyfriend at that time, who I played football with, and says, hey, I want you to talk, it's like she just got him there. I want you to talk to him and tell him why he needs God. And um, so I spent three hours talking with this guy who was a fullback, that was defense, and um, after three hours, he's looking at me and said, okay, whatever, you know, and we, we were friends. We weren't like buddy buddy, but we were friends. And it did no good at all because I focused on all the things that God wasn't focusing on. Why the Bible was right. Why you should believe the Bible. And all these facts of all these things. And I didn't share how God saved me. I didn't share just the simple cross of Jesus Christ. Now, since then, I don't, you know, it's not like we connect with them a little, not much at all. So I don't know where he's at in his faith right now. But many times over the years, I would do that. I mean, it's, ever, it's like we want to use our wisdom to affect a person for Jesus. When Paul went into a new region that was a brand new church, they were very immature in a lot of ways. And, they didn't know a lot of things, and they, they needed someone like the Apostle Paul to come in and show them and teach them. And um, Paul had one simple message. I'm going to tell you about the cross, mm -hmm. because your whole culture is built around this philosophy of who can argue the best. <laughs> and I'm sure almost every one of you in here at one time got in a debate or an argument, and I'm not saying you're fighting somebody on why you should believe God, why the Bible is right, and, and why this, maybe this doctrine, this theology is right, or whatever it is. And I'm just saying, Paul didn't use that here. He used the cross of Jesus Christ. So, let's um, read here, um, and start in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 18. And I'm just gonna read mostly a little bit out of the chapter one and, and, and talk a little bit about chapter two. This is a message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, 
but we are being saved. Um, the, but who are the, but we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. As the scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intellect. So I'm just going to pause here for a second. When we focus on the cross, I already said this, but it's so important. God is at work. But when you communicate with somebody, God actually did die on the cross. Jesus Christ is God. He did die on the cross to save you, forgive you of your sin. Because probably the absolute thing, I don't even mention it this morning, that every one of you in here has talked to somebody who said, I'm not good enough to go to your church. I'm not right yet. Why do we have this mentality in our whole culture that we have to be good enough to go to a church? That doesn't make, it, first of all, it's, it's not biblical at all, is it? And not at all. Now, I believe it's the church's fault over the centuries that created that whole thing. You have to look a certain way in order to do this. Some of you grew up in holiness type stuff, right? Where it's like, man, if you didn't look at or do any of this stuff, you might have lost your salvation yesterday because of that. And it's just crazy when we compare it to the life of Jesus. So when we focus on the cross, God is at work in their heart. They have, to, they have to wrestle with this thing. You mean I could be right with the Father? I could be totally righteous and holy before God only by accepting the cross of Jesus Christ and not acting out and being righteous myself. But when we focus on man's wisdom, what do we create? We create division. We create denominations. We create everything out there that does not lead to salvation. It leads to religion. You have to act like this or do this in order to be right with God. And it's all false. God's looking for one thing. So in verse 20, so where does this leave the philosopher? I love this. Where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of the world look foolish. Since God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Now, I don't know about you, but I like Paul in this manner because he just said, my foolish preaching. That, that it's, it's like, thank you, Paul, because we think Paul is this great orator. Well, no, he's not. He even said, I'm, I'm just kind of a goober. I'm really smart. I know theology. I write theological books. God had me do that. <clears throat> But Paul in his, who God created him to be, he was just one of us. He was no better than any of us, and he just learned to completely focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It's also foolish to the Greeks, and that's everybody else besides the Jews, who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it is all nonsense. And that is fine if people say that. But the one thing that you do, if you share with somebody, God died on the cross through his son Jesus Christ to save you, to forgive you of your sin, so you could have this relationship with him. And just leave it at that. The Holy Spirit is working on their heart. Yes, you love them. Yes, you serve them. Yes, you befriend them. Yes, you, you just partake in their life and become a part of their life. But if you keep the message simple, then God has it. He's at work in your life. And He convicts, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He convicts our life. He shows us, but they have hope that I don't have to perform in order to be right with God. Because as soon as they get it in their head, I have to perform in order to be right with God then the devil has their mind and just goes crazy with their minds and their hearts. All right, um, I think it's verse 28. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ, for our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. 
Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only in the Lord. I'm not going to comment on that only because I want to get more into chapter 2 here. All right. So, chapter 2. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. Now, what's God's secret plan? From the beginning, from the foundation of the world, before you and I ever existed, or even me ever existed, the, the triune God, God, Father, Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, Jesus, had a plan that they came up with. Now, if you look at the whole Old Testament, there's a whole bunch of things in there. If you just read the Old Testament, you are like, holy smokes, I, there's so much stuff in there. But God, obviously, in his sovereign plan, had people write the New Testament, which is just the extension of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and it tells the secrets of God. It actually tells for us what the heck those are, and I'll get to that one, the main one, in a minute. Verse 2, For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness. Now this is... Anybody in here ever feel weak when you want to present the gospel? How about timid or trembling? Yes. We feel those things when we want to tell people about God, and that's a good thing. The reason it's good is because it makes us depend on what? Him. If we're confident in our debating skills, I, usually we're not going to win anybody. We might, win, we might think that we win an argument, but it's just like, no. Now, let's go back to the culture that we live in here, or the culture I deal with in Spokane, or wherever it's at over the world. The culture that we're talking about right here is completely foolish. It is crazy town compared to what people live out in their lives, right? It's crazy. But God has already said, I'm gonna win the world, through foolishness. And wise people who want to debate me, they're not going to get it. The only ones who are going to get it who dwell on the cross. What, what does this mean that someone hung on a cross and forgave me my sins? What does that mean? What does it mean that when I accept the cross and repent of my sin, that Jesus himself gives me his righteousness, and I become completely right with God. That doesn't mean we're sinless. That doesn't mean we need to mature. I'm not saying that at all. But the cross in Jesus Christ makes us perfect in the sight of God. Religious minds cannot handle that. They can't. Because it's too much grace. It's too much love. But our message should be the cross. Got to go through the cross. If we can go through any other way, then everybody else in the world has an argument on how to do it. But if there's only one way, there's no other argument to get to the Father except through His Son. Um, all right, verse three. I came to you in weakness, timid, trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. I like that too because I'm, I'm just, I'm a pretty average dude. When I talk to people, it's just like, when I listen to people out there that are really smart, it's just like, I can't really follow along very well. But when I, when I talk to somebody like myself, it's like I just feel better, because I just, I'm just kind of a plain person. So rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Now. That right there, between the cross of Jesus Christ, the Word of God which you have in your hand, the Bible, whatever translation you use, or multiple translations like I use, and the Holy Spirit is it. God, and we're going to get into it a little bit deeper here in a minute, God has connected you, because of the cross, directly to the Father. Now this is where I've parted ways with all denominations. I, when it comes to Pentecostals or Charismatics, or when it comes to the most conservative 
of, of denominations. I don't, it doesn't matter what it is or what their name is. I hate them all. You know why? Because they all set their rules on how to do it. The more we focus on just becoming biblical, loving people who do community together, who have a message of the cross of Jesus Christ, and to learn just to walk daily connected to the Father through the Holy Spirit, which I'll get to more in a minute, we're going to be far better off. That, if you do that, then you're a Baptist costume. You, <laughs> you might be conservative over here, but you finally realize that you're only connected to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that, if you could imagine just a pipeline, whether it's a water hose, fireman's water hose, connected to your spirit, directly to the throne of God, that's what the Holy Spirit is. And if you're a born-again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you are neither a conservative Christian or a Pentecostal Christian. You are a biblical Christian. That makes sense? Because, man, we got to focus on what does the Bible say? God's secret plan in verse 1 and also in chapter 1. What is that? Well, Ephesians, Paul writes Ephesians as well. He tells us what God's secret plan is. Ephesians 3, 8, um, and you can just write this down and read it later. Um, it says this. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And um, Paul obviously preached to Jews, but mostly to Gentiles. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, has kept secret from the beginning. What's the plan? What is God, or what is Paul talking about? He, he mentions it almost in all of his books, this plan of this mysterious thing that God kept secret. And in verse 10, it says this in Ephesians 3.10, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to, the all, to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul, our God's plan, now don't get offended, is to use a bunch of goobers. <laughs> who talk plain, who rely on him to go out and share the message of the only message that has power is the cross of Jesus Christ. And we get no credit. But we are, the church all over the world is his instrument to go out. And when you go out, like was already mentioned and gets mentioned like you guys do every week, when you go out and you love and you share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, the power of God is at work. But if we want to debate all sorts of other things, which I love to talk about theology, and, and but it doesn't really get to talk about a whole lot about theology with, with non-Christians. It's just like, what is, what, I don't want to go there with you. I want to talk about hunting. I want to talk about something else, okay? When we talk to the world, unsaved people, let's deliver the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And get the Holy Spirit behind you, because when you mention the cross, in that you are, God has, has made you free from sin, all the conviction and the condemnation and the guilt in your life, can be completely wiped free in one act of obedience to repent and give your life to Christ. People might be interested in that because our world's pretty messed up, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're messed up culture right now all over the United States. That's a good message to have. All right, continuing on in verse 6, in chapter 2. Yet, when I was among mature believers, I did speak with words of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or the rulers of this world. Who, well, let me go back, sorry. I wanted to make sure I say this, because um, Paul in, in Ephesians and Corinthians and in other books, he makes it very clear that God's purpose 
is his church, and that's Jew and Gentile alike, and it's always been that way. Um, people who have faith in God. Do any of you think that there might be a spiritual warfare going on over this reservation or across the river, the Kettle Falls, or any other place you live? When we do the gospel, Paul very specifically says, God is using us as an instrument. He loves us, his church, it's his body. He's doing that to display to who? All the heavenly hosts. You know why it's such a miracle? Is because we are goobers. We are like, how do we do? Well, God just says, if you do it my way, it's gonna be done. And then when one person gets saved, and that person begins to get, you know, mature in the Lord and delivered of stuff, and they begin to live a life for Jesus, all, every being ever created gets to see that and gets to witness that. And every one of them, I, I, this is my opinion, it's not a biblical thing, it's my opinion, it still goes, I can't believe that happened. There's no way that person should have been able to do that for the kingdom of God. And God says, that's because you don't understand how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through Van and Zach and everybody else that is completely incapable of doing it. But when you rely on what God wants to do, all hell and all, and I say that just because demonic forces, all of hell and all of heaven is to see the kingdom of God is being expanded at a rate that they just can't believe is being expanded. And they're just sitting back going, I still can't believe it. How did that happen? How did that happen in East Africa? How did that happen in, in Russia? How did that happen over here? How did that happen in South America? How does it, how does it happen in China when Mao Zedong tried to kill every Christian and anybody with an education in China when he becomes to power, and supposedly for the 40 or 50 year reign that he was in power, there was less than a million Christians that believed in Jesus Christ when he started, and he tried to kill them all. And then when he died, missionaries went in there and counted, and there were 50 million Christians. Do you think the authorities in heaven and all the angels and all the demonic creatures ever created went? How in the world did that happen? So I want to encourage you this morning. I know the spiritual reality of this place. And again, I'm not putting it down because it's really no different than any place. If you, over the years, I've heard Kettle Falls is probably one of the most alcohol-filled places on earth. And it's been that way for 50 plus years or even more. And Colville has its stuff and Republic has its stuff. And Every region has its demons and principalities that want to rule over it. But guess what? Paul went into a place that had no gospel, no Christians, nothing going on. The culture was as demonic as you can get. I mean, they say it was like Las Vegas and, and New York combined. It was so grotesque. Yet, he brought in the foolishness of the cross. And revival took place. And I just want to encourage you, that's what we're supposed to do. To extend the kingdom of God in one person's life, it is the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip forward to verse 10. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, which is the relationship with God the Father. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. So, I want to encourage you here. Um, well, whatever, however you grew up, whoever you listen to theologically or a teacher, I, I want to encourage you that you have a relationship with the Spirit that knows the deep secrets of God the Father because He's God, right? He's the Holy Spirit, not God. So I think He knows everything about God the Father. Guess who he wants to deliver those to? You. 
Now, you might have grown up in a church or been a part of a church that taught against that. Like, man, you could... You know, it's like, no. The, when I wake up in the morning, if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood or somewhere in between, I still say, good morning, Holy Spirit. How you doing? What are we going to do today? Yeah. That is the relationship. It is not, oh my gosh, i got to go to my prayer closet for the first hour. Then I have to do this. And then the Holy Spirit can talk to me. And that is a religious attitude that is not anywhere in the Bible. It's not anywhere in the scriptures. God has a relationship with you, and he wants it to be 27 or 7, 24, 7, there we go, seven days a week, all day long, with you, so you connect with him. Let's read along. This is awesome. Verse 11, no one can know a person's thoughts except you know who you are. In other words, I can't read your mind. I, you know who you are. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has truly given us. So a question I have for you this morning, and don't raise your hand or anything like that, but how much do you know that God's given you? When you look at scripture, like Ephesians chapter 1, this, it'll blow your mind. When you look at this right here, when you look at this, the whole of scripture, do you realize it's yours? Or do you have to go to somebody to get advice from what the scripture says, which we do sometimes, but God didn't make it like that. God made it so if you just dwell in the Lord, find out who you are in Christ, find out all the amazing things God has given you as an individual person, you really don't need to go somewhere and be taught the scriptures because we have the spirit of God in us that lives in us. That makes sense. So you, on the way to work, on the way home, eating dinner, going to the bathroom, taking a shower, sitting down, fellowshipping, the Holy Spirit is in you, and you're connected to the Father in heaven 24-7. In a Christian life, there's never a time where God cuts that off. Even if you sin, he doesn't put you in the closet, and, and you've got to go there for three days. Now we think that, but it's not true. Now, he wants us to repent right away. If we know that we sin, we do something wrong. Yes, Father, I'm sorry. Or, man, Zach, I'm sorry. I said something that was offensive. I didn't mean to do that. I apologize. We need to have a, a heart of repentance to do that. But we don't dis get disconnected from the Father. It's not in the Scripture. Unless we go off and purposely do that and go off into a life of sin, then, yeah, that's a different story. Someone who wants to connect with God and they're born again and they want to learn, it's a, it's, a, it's a fire hose between you and heaven. And I want you to get that in your mind this week that I can hear from God all the time. That doesn't mean he's going to speak to me in an audible voice. We, we have an audible voice in the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit does want to show you why. Because Paul went into a region that was absolutely against the culture that he was going to bring. You live in a place that is absolutely against the culture of, of what God wants to do here. I live in a place that is the same thing. But when I walk throughout the week, for example, I was ministering to a lady in our church a few weeks ago with another lady. And um, talking, just kind of going over some things and definitely some really heavy, heavy things going on in her life. Instantly, the Lord said to me, this is what you need to do. And he's like, okay. So I just asked this lady, I said, okay, here's where we're at. Listen to you. And I, and I love to listen to people and their, their pain, where they're at, where they, where they, what pain they've been through, trauma. And if they're still in forgiveness and bitterness, I, I want to hear it all. So after listening to it, I wasn't frustrated at all, but I said, okay, here's what I think the Lord is showing me. I want to pass it by you, and I can't force you to do it, but if you're all right with it, we'll do this, okay? And I said, instead of going through this book that I do, the Restored book, I don't think mentally right now, because of all the, the anguish and the depression and the anxiety that's going on, I don't even think you can get through one sentence of it. 
And she goes, you're right. <laughs> it was just like, I, if I did read one sentence, I would have, I have to read it 16 times to even know what it said. So I go, I, I feel your pain right now. I know where you're at. I go, how about if we just take, we just take the biggest things out of your life right now? Let's write down the list of people that for years you've been bitter against, that you hate, that you just want to punish, that you, all this stuff. This person agreed to do it. So we spent the next three weeks doing that. And this is a person who has been in anguish, and I'm talking deep, dark, depression, anxiety, um, grotesque stuff for 60 years. 60 years. And at a point where they couldn't function anymore. And um, more medication was added and just different things. And so they agreed to do this. And after three weeks, and then a couple times with a different lady in the church, who some of you know, who was really good at administering one-on-one -on -one to same-sex ladies. And I won't minister to a lady unless I'm with another lady. Um, she's free. She's gonna testify next week in church how she's free. But she took a step to obey God. She knew she was a Christian because she's been a Christian for a long time. But her, her ability to hear God and actually do what God's asked her to do and all these things has just been hindered for decades. Now she's completely free because she actually took the steps to do what God wants her to do. And now the, 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 this experience, the the day-to-day -day hearing from God and just fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit and just walking with God the Father is so real to her. It's never been that real to her. She's been a Christian for decades. And, and I know she has been, but she's just been in a lot of pain. So that's what God wants to do with people. He wants to set them completely free, but we got to bring the right message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, I have no idea where I left off. I'll go down to verse 12. And we have received God's Spirit so we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Now, Jesus, when he was teaching in John chapter 14, he's with his disciples and with other people too, he made this really simple. This is what Jesus said. When I leave, I'm going to come to you guys, and me and the Father are going to make our home inside of you. Now, they didn't understand it at the time. They didn't understand it until Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out. But this is the sad thing to me. So many Christians in our world, and you guys know them too, live in defeat live in depression and anxiety, live in a, a mindset, in a heart set, that doesn't believe you could have this radical, amazing, day-to-day -day relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because churches have taught that's for the good Christians, or we don't do that anymore because it's done away with a long time ago. There's nowhere in Scripture where God has taken His Holy Spirit out of the church and said, go do it on your own. Matter of fact, I don't know about you guys, as we move forward in our culture, I would think that we need the Holy Spirit more, don't we? Because we're messed up. I mean, our culture is crazy right now. We need the power of God in our life more than we've ever needed it in the history of the church. Now, when I say that, when I say the power of God in our life, I do not mean, you know, we can pray for people who get healed, I believe in all the gifts, I believe in all the power of God, but when I say that, I don't mean that anybody gets to take it for themselves, or anybody gets to take credit for it, because that's where people get off track. Man, you got to go to Joyce to get prayer for healing. She has the gift, baby. And maybe she does. But you don't need to go to Joyce to get prayer for healing because every Christian carries the Holy Spirit in their life. And you can, whatever, yes, you do know how to pray. You just say, God, would you heal this person? That's it. There's no special way to do it. 
You do not have to speak in King James <laughs> to pray for someone to get healed. I'm just letting you know that. You don't need to speak in New King James or New Living Translation or any other translation. You just need to speak in the plain language that God gave you. God, would you heal this person in Jesus' name? That's it. Because the power of God works through you in that. Or, God, on my way to work today, or God, I'm going to go see this person. Is there anything you want to show me in that person's life? And I believe all the gifts are always used to build, not to tear down. So please don't go to that person with a whole bunch of judgment. Okay. The Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin. And if they ask you, yes, you can tell them what's going on. That's totally fine. We go there to build with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul was in Corinth, just like you're in this place right now, which most of you are going to die in this place, which is a good thing, God wants to use you in a mighty way. But he wants to encourage you. The relationship you have with God the Father does not get cut off unless you want to cut off. And if you just agree with what God says about the great treasures in Jesus Christ, you're only going to hear him more. You're going to understand him more. But here's what we do. We, we, we say, oh, I sinned or I did this or I'm having a hard time getting over this thing in my life and God will just never use me. Well, Go read about all the disciples that were all goobers, just like us. Peter always put his foot in his mouth, he was, but he was being used by God in a powerful way because he just finally understood that it was never going to be done like he thought it was going to be done, and it was going to be done like God thought it was going to be done, which is the kingdom of God. So, God's secret or mysterious plan is that he would live inside of us, and I'm going to end it right there because... Um, I'm just going to read uh, verse 13 again. When you tell these things, when you tell, uh, or when we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak God's words, God given uh, to us by the Holy Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. So, might not connect with you right now, but I just want to end with this. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're a believer, which I know you are, definitely wants to speak wisdom in every situation that you walk into. He does. If you don't think he does, then you don't understand what he wants to do through you and how much he loves you. Because he's going to expand his kingdom, which is getting someone saved, filled with the Spirit, and walking out this thing called discipleship. That's the expansion of the kingdom. He wants to do that through his church, which is you. Amen? And you all walk in the power and the ability to hear God all the time. Now, I believe 95% of the time you hear God, he quickens you with the scripture that you've been studying. And you have an answer for that situation because you've been listening to God in the Bible. And yes, he speaks to you as well. Amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you for your awesome grace, Lord. But Lord, thank you so much that you've chosen each one of us, Lord. Everybody in this church and the ones that aren't here right now, Lord God, you have chosen to live through us, Lord God. That even when I look at all my wrongdoings, when I look at my attitude sometimes, and all the things that I kind of downgraded myself, Lord God, you still live through me, you still speak to me, you still want to touch the world through me, Lord God. So I just speak that over this church right now, Lord God, that you want to speak through everybody here. You want to uh, parent through everybody here. Wisdom on how to be a parent. Wisdom on how to do all the things that we do in life. You want to give us wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit, but especially, Lord God, to touch the world. Just like before we were born again, Lord God, living living in just a completely worldly life, Lord God, and you came to us through somebody else that spoke words of wisdom to us, Lord God, and we accepted the cross of Jesus Christ. So we pray that and thank you for it. We pray for the food in Jesus' name.